the church said amen. 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 You know, I've always been a believer that good singing leads to good preaching. Right. And we have had some good singing today. Amen. The brother has blessed us richly to be able to lift our voices and praise unto God, and I am just thankful. In fact, there is a song, Sing Hallelujah, by and by. If you're familiar with it, I want you to join me in a verse or two of that song, and then we will go into the message. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, oh, we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. It says, the sin of Judah is written with a pen or stylus of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their ashram beside the green trees upon the high hills. Oh, my mountain in the field, I will give your wealth and all your treasure to the spoil and your high places for sin throughout all your territory. And you, through your own fault, will loosen your hand and discontinue from your heritage which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in a land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger, yes. which will burn throughout the ages. Yes. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the strong man who trusts in and relies on frail man, making weak flesh his arm, and whose mind and heart turn aside from the Lord. Yes. For
For he shall be like a shrub or a person naked and destitute in the desert. And he shall not see any good come, but shall dwell in the parched places in the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. The subject for this morning taken from verse 5 and 6, a parched and salty wasteland. A parched and salty wasteland. And as we go through this lesson, uh, there's a theme that, that I want to stick with in this lesson, and that is betrayal comes at a high cost. Betrayal comes at a high cost. But let's consider for a moment. And, and I want to make this as relevant to our youth as possible. All right. A parched and salty wasteland. All right. yes, sir. When you think of that, when you think of a wasteland, you think of some place that is desolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That nothing good takes place in. Yes, sir. Um, children might associate that with the principal's office. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> because it's a place if you're there, nine times out of ten, you don't want to be there. And you sit there wondering how you winded up there in the first place. And then you're scared and you're nervous because you don't know what is to come. That is an example of a parched and salty wasteland. And the writer Jeremiah, he uses this to paint a picture and to talk to God's people and to let them know what kind of calamity they are in. Yes, and my goal in this lesson today is I want us all, not just the youth, but everybody in here, no matter what our age may be, right. to come to a good understanding when we betray God, yes, when we turn our back on God, yes, and when we start doing our own thing, yes. we wind up in a very terrible and dreadful place yes, right. in the eyes of God. And that is not a place that we want to stay. Yes, right. And I, I hope that we come to an understanding that at the conclusion of this message, that's not a place we have to remain. And it's not a place that we have to be stuck in. Many people live their lives day by day. And I'm talking about young and old. There are kids out there, 10, 11, 12 years old, that are already fed up with life. That are already fed up with living. That are already fed up with the things that they have to deal with, the daily persecutions they are going through in life. And, and I hope that I can speak to someone today and that at the conclusion of this message, you would know that that's not a place. If you're there, you don't have to be there. You don't have to stay there. And if it's not a place you're at, you can avoid it altogether. And most importantly, if there is someone here that is not a member of God's kingdom, you have the opportunity today to become part of his kingdom. Because God established a kingdom. He only established one. And I'm thankful to God that he did that. I'm thankful to God that he paid that way. But the description of this wasteland, when you think of a wasteland, as I said, it's a place where nothing good happens. It's dry. No water. No moisture. You think about it, if you were outside right now, where this Texas heat is beaming down, you would be feeling the effects of the sun on your body. And if you stayed out there long enough, and it wouldn't even take that long, I would say five, ten minutes, you will begin to sweat. Yes, sir. Some might even begin to sweat profusely yes, because of the effects of the sun. Uh -huh. But the funny thing is, while the outside of your body might be sweating or producing Come on, fluid, All right. the inside of your body, your mouth and your tongue, is going to be drying up. Yes, sir. It's going to be losing its moisture mm -hmm. because of the effects of the heat. That's what happens in that salty wasteland. The salt is prevalent there. And now, salt in and of itself has a purpose. And it can be good. But as the old saying goes, too much of anything is not a good thing. So while we need it in adequate doses, we can't overdose. We can't take in too much. We're going to wind up in a bad place where we're dehydrated. Yes, and then we're going to wind up desperate. Yes, right. So, three points I want to focus on here. We're going to make this quick. When the good goes bad, All right. betrayal of the highest order, All right. and God's power. Yes, 
And as a side note, I want, I want to acknowledge, now Brother Barry made you aware of my family that is here, mm -hmm. but I also have some family that has come with me today. I have my niece that is with me today, and I have one of my brothers. He surprised me. I wasn't expecting him today. <laughs> Glad to see him here. And uh, also, one of my best friends. And I am glad to be able to call him not only a best friend, but a brother in Christ. And I am just glad to have him with me today. And I appreciate their support. You know, when you go through life, you need friends. And you need family to support you. And young folk, I want you to understand that. You need friends and you need family to support you. But now everybody that calls you friend is not your friend. Everybody that says, hey, I got your back. Some of them are looking to put a knife in it and twist it. So you have to pay attention, even at a young age, you young men that are sitting right here from even at your age, That's right. you have to be careful because there are young folks out there, even your age, mm -hmm. that will be too deceptive and that will come into your life and that will cause turmoil and will cause you to make bad decisions if you're That's not wise. Right. So you have to pay attention to not only people's words, but more importantly, their actions. Right. Because we can talk a good game in life. But when it comes to the actions, they never lie. The actions always reveal our truest motives and our truest intentions. All right. All right. When the good goes bad, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 16, looking at the first two verses. And it says, the word of the Lord also came to me, saying, now I'm reading from the King James now. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. Now, just hearing that, you might think, okay, well, why is God saying this? Because we know that under Jewish tradition and Jewish culture, it was a good thing for a man to go out and find a wife yes, and to start a family. Yes, uh, it's still a very good thing to do today yes. for a man to, once he becomes of age and has established himself, to go out and find a wife and to establish a family. Yes. But there are certain dictates and orders that is required in doing that. Uh, as a young person even now, I know the young people, they're not necessarily ready to think about marriage and things of that nature. But as you get older and you start, boys, you start noticing girls and girls, you start noticing boys and you start paying attention uh, to different qualities in them and how they act and carry themselves. And you start deciding, well, I might like him or I might like her. You have to be careful in your decisions on who you associate with. You have to pay attention to the actions. So what does it say here? Symbols of good fortune. Symbols of punishment. We have to be careful of this because there are ways you can tell when a person is good. Come on. Look at their character. Look at how they behave with their family. Amen. Right. Look at how they behave with their friends. Uh -huh. And see, I can remember being in elementary school and in middle school and in high school, and and you know, always hearing uh, the young ladies, certain guys, they would just uh, drool over because he was so rebellious, uh, or because he stood out. He made a name for himself. All right. We have to be careful for the people that stand out. Yeah, right. Now, if you're standing out for God, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I would encourage that, and I would applaud that uh, any day of the week. That's right. But you have to be careful when you see somebody standing out for themselves, or, or what we call them class clowns. Right. When you have those class clowns that are out there just self-seeking, and yeah. trying to gain attention for themselves and, and disrupting the classroom, yes, sir. disrupting the teacher, and, and disrupting and picking on others. That's right. Pay close attention to them. Because that's, that's not a good social skill to have. That's right. Now, the world will tell you that that's a, a form of popularity. Mm. The world would have you to believe it's okay. Well, he's just acting out. He's just expressing himself. No. We have gotten in this world today, and especially in this country, to where people want to have so much freedom to express themselves in many different ways, in many different facets, and they don't want to have to give an account for their actions. Let me do as I please, just don't hold me responsible. Now, children know that that's not the case in school because if you, if you act out in school, if you act out in the classroom, what does the teacher do? Call your parents or send you to the office or they pull you aside and talk to you. In other words, it doesn't go unchecked. That's right. It's funny that a little boy knows this. But we as adults live in the world day by day. We go to work and we act how we want to. We say what we want to. We talk about people like we want to. We have to our jobs like we want to. And then when somebody tries to call us out on it, hey, you need to get out of my business. 
You need to get out of my life. You need to I'm doing me. You need to focus on you. Well, the last time I checked scripture, God said that we are supposed to be accountable to one another. And bear one another's burdens. What that means is that when I see somebody mess up, especially if I know them and I'm familiar with them, it is my duty. It is my, understand this young folk, my responsibility to say something to them. Now that doesn't mean that I go off trying to hurt their feelings or be rude and condescending. But I got to let them know, hey man, what you did was wrong. What you did was out of line. And don't just tell them what they did was wrong. Tell them why. Amen. Yeah, right. See, we want to tell, we, that's another bad habit we have in today's society. We like to tell folks why they're wrong or, or, or that they did wrong, but we don't like to tell them why. But see, here in the scripture, God talks to Jeremiah, and he doesn't just tell them that they're wrong. He tells them why. When we go further in the, in the chapter of Jeremiah chapter 16, God says, they shall die gruesome deaths. I mean, chapter verse four now. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Now I want you guys to know something. This letter was written to God's chosen. That's right. I want you to think about that, young folk. In other words, in today's time, that would be applicable to the church. Yes, that's right. He's not talking to foreigners out there that have never known God, right. that have never acknowledged God. Mm -hmm. He's talking to people that know the truth oh, yeah. and aren't obeying it. That's well, right. what's your point in making that, Brother Colton? Well, when you think about some of the things I just read, where it says they shall die gruesome deaths, <laughs> they shall not be lamented. That's saying they go, that end is going to be terrible. And you're not supposed to feel sorry for them. Think about that. You're not supposed to show any remorse. You're not supposed to show any kindness to their situation. Because of the decisions that they have made, because of the choices that they have made. When you turn your back on God, he pulls all the plugs out. Now his grace is sufficient as long as we're alive. But we need to know when we turn our back on God, Come on. It, it's, it's not a game. Right. It's not a game. That's right. right. He doesn't feel any remorse when we go through the bad things in life. Sometimes we sit and wonder, why, why am I having so much trouble in my family? Why are my kids listening to me? Why is my job giving me such heartache? Why is my family not helping me when, when I need help? How are you living? Yeah. How are you living your life? Yes, sir. How are you serving God? Is your life an example to God? Come on, preach You know, the Bible tells us that we are the closest thing to a book of the Bible that anyone will read. Come on now. Sometimes we are the closest thing because we know there are people out there that are atheists or that are agnostic. Their ears are turned off to the word of God because of how man has twisted scripture and twisted teaching scripture. Yeah. Well. And when you face situations like that, young folk, and you'll, you'll find it in your lives too. I can remember being 10, 11, 12 years of age and yeah. talking about God and having people say to me, man, that's foolish. Huh. That's silly. There's no God. God doesn't exist. We are just people and we live in God. I'm talking about 10, 12, 13, 14 years old. Children have learned this. And you'll face the same thing today, and they'll be more bold with it now because the fact of the matter is, it is okay, and it, it really, it's, it's taught as being acceptable or encouraged if you challenge or deface religion today in society. On young folks, you need to know that. If you're going to share your beliefs, if you're going to share your faith, if you're going to walk proudly in Christ, you need to know you're going to face some challenges. There are going to be some people that are going to challenge you, that are going to challenge your way of thinking, that are going to say what you're doing is foolishness, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your mind. And society and the school systems will support them. Yeah. All right. Because they will say it is their right to yeah. disagree. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then they will turn around and try and limit you on what you say. Yeah, that's right. And they'll try to say it's a separation of church and state. Know this, young folks, because right. this is something that's going to be prevalent yeah. in your life. Yeah. Right. And it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. All right. All right. But when we turn our backs on God, we have to pay. 
God punishes us. He works on us from time to time. And what eventually happens is we come to a point where God's peace is removed from us. And that's what he talks about in verse 5 when he says, For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to, to the lament or bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people. Loving kindness and mercy. This is what he takes away yes, sir. when we turn our backs You're right. on God. Amen. This is what it feels like to be in that parch in Salty Wasteland. Right. This is what it feels like when the world has turned its back on you. I'm paraphrasing now. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. But how did that happen? It happened because of betrayal. That's right. Betrayal of the highest order. Let's drop down to verse number 11 in Jeremiah chapter 16 as we move here through the lesson. Where the scripture does say, then you shall say to them, this is what God is telling Jeremiah to say to them, why they're going through all this. Because your fathers have forsaken you, says the Lord. They have walked after other gods and have served them and worshiped them and have forsaken me and not kept my law. Lord, and you have done worse than your fathers. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it starts in the home. Right. How are we teaching our kids? Mm -hmm. now, I don't have any children myself, but the, but the children, the kids that I interact with in my life, I always try and, and teach them how to live, what God expects of them, Amen. what God requires. Are we teaching our kids that? Because what we don't realize is if we're not, we're teaching them just the opposite of our actions. Yes, sir. Do we take them to Wednesday night Bible class? Yes, sir. Do we take them to Sunday evening service? Do we make sure they're here for Sunday school? It's something to think about. Let's go a little bit further. Amen. Other than Sundays and Wednesdays, how often do our kids interact with other kids in the church? How often do we as people interact with each other in the church? Mm -hmm. All right. When you go back and look at Acts chapter 2, yes, sir. in the early church, that scripture says they were together daily. Now, that doesn't mean that every time they got together, they was reading from Isaiah or Jeremiah or or, or, or one of the books of the old law, but they were together daily. That's right. How are we supposed to be the family of God if we don't act like them? How are we supposed to be the people of God if we don't act like we're his Amen. people? Right. We're supposed to be close-knit. Amen. But instead, if you got some folks to go to congregations that have been going there for years, and people don't even know that they're members of the church. That happens. Why does that happen? Because we're not bonded like we should be. You think about it, young folk. If you went to, now I know you guys are out of school now, and I'm sure you're glad to be free of that. Happy to have your summer. But just think about it. If you had to go to school tomorrow, just pretend. And somebody came up, you were with your friend. And somebody came up and started talking to you. Like they're your friend and they've just been knowing you all this time. You're going to look at them like, I, I don't know you. And, and, and that's if you're nice. You might say something mean. So, sometimes young folks can be, can be cruel. Yeah. Kids, as they say, have no filter. <laughs> you would look at them like, they're strange. Who is this person? I don't know them. And you got folks in church looking at each other the same. We got folks looking at each other the same exact way in church. We're supposed to be God's family. All right. Amen. But it starts in the home. And what happens is when the parents in the home don't take them to church and they don't spend time with them and they don't take them to Bible class and they don't specifically spend time with them about God's word and then the kids grow up and they leave home and then they don't go to church and the parents, oh, why did they leave? And then the parents are trying to, you know, you need to get back into church and you need to come back to the house of God. And were they ever really there to begin with? No, yeah. Were they ever there to begin with? Yes, sir. Yeah. But continuing on, he says, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face. See, God is watching us. I'm in verse That's 17 right. now. All right. God is watching us constantly. Know this, young folks. Because sometimes, and in adults, we get it twisted too. We'll do something wrong, and all we think about is the fact that, well, no human eyes saw it. 
or no one that I'm concerned about reprimanding me saw it or was ever witnessing. So I've gotten away with it. I'm good. My conscience is fine. Know that God sees everything we do. That's right. Not only that, he knows our thoughts. He knows how we think. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. And you know, as a kid, what used to really puzzle me was when my mom and my dad could figure out what I was going to do before I did it. And I was like, how did they know? It would shock me. I would just, I'd have to call. God knows the same thing about everybody. Your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, he knows our thoughts and intents and actions. Well, Brother Coach, what does this mean? What this means is that we have to make wise decisions. We have to make good choices. Now, I'm not telling you to get out there and walk a perfect line. We're human. We're bound to mess up. We're going to get off course every now and again. We're going to make mistakes every now and again. But the good thing is that God is long-suffering. But now, while he's long-suffering and letting us make our mistakes, he will punish us. He will uh, whip us, as they say while we mess it up. And he'll continue to do so until we get right. Amen. Amen. All right. The punishment of God is something severe. There's nothing to be taken lightly. Anytime you get to a point in your life where God has said, basically for all the tips, I'm paraphrasing that what we read, you're getting what you're deserving, and there is no recourse, there is no I hope you feel better, you're getting what you deserve. You earned this. So then the only recourse left is you have to make up in your mind. And that's the key to all this, free will. People twist free will, they misinterpret free will, and they butcher it when it comes to scripture. When you have folks out there talking about catching the Holy Ghost and, uh, and being possessed by demons and devils, we know that that is a lie. Now, the Spirit worked in a certain way when the apostles were here on this earth because that was what God had commanded. It is how he planned things. It is how the reception worked. But when those things were fulfilled and we got the word, that was no longer needed. Because now we have God's word to study. We have his word to read day by day. And I'm, let, me, let me share this with our young folk. And with the adults as well. Now, there's nothing wrong with encouraging a child to go to a Bible-based college or high school or institution for higher learning, let me say it that way. Something that's backed by the church. Nothing wrong with that. But if we teach our children how to read and know and understand God's word for themselves Amen. as a child as they progress through the years. Yeah. If we make it just as important to them as we do schoolwork, mm -hmm. we have some folk ready to preach by the time they get out of high school before. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Not saying that they that they don't need to go to Southwestern or to Abilene to learn some things, but they'll be sound Amen. and ready to go at that point in time. We should never <coughs> question the stability of God's word. We just have to be stern with it and enforce it. Let's bring this lesson home. God's power. God's power requires acknowledgement. Remember what I just said a minute ago? It's all about free will, but in that free will, we have to come to a decision and an understanding. It requires acknowledgement. If we skip down to verse number 21 in Jeremiah chapter 16, it says... Therefore, behold, I will once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Amen. We have to acknowledge God's power. Young folks, even in your life, you have to acknowledge God's power. But what does that mean, Brother Coach? What that means is that if you're out with your friends and they're saying, hey, let's go, let's go to the store and take some drinks, go get some soda, not pay for it. You have to make the decision in your mind on what you're going to do. In making that decision, you need to come to an understanding. What they're talking about doing is wrong. Keep that in the forefront of your mind before you consider anything else. 
what they're talking about doing is wrong. But these are my friends. I've been knowing them since I was two and three. But what they're talking about doing is wrong. And it is against God's will. God does not want you stealing or taking anything. Because what that, what that suggests, number one, is that you're dishonest. And what it really suggests is that you are lacking in some areas and that you have needs that aren't being met. And this is why if you do something wrong like that, if you steal or if you lie, your parents get upset. Because the first thing they'll say to you, well, if you wanted something that badly, I had for you here at the house. Or you could have came and gotten a dollar. You could have came and gotten some money. You could have came and asked me. Why settle for failure when success is free? We have to live our lives in a way where we are not settling for failure, young folks. We have everything we need. That doesn't mean we have everything we want. If I had everything I wanted, I might have a Bentley. If I had everything I wanted, and I think I want a Bentley, I get one and might decide it's more of a headache than I realize. But I have a way to get around. I have clothes on my back. Clearly, I don't go without eating. I'm not missing any meals. God has blessed me. I have a job. I'm employed. But don't follow after the Joneses. Or don't follow after the people of this world because young folks, all they're going to do is try and go about any underhanded or sneaky way they can to get what they want. So just so they can have a status, just so they can say something about themselves. Be content with what God has blessed you with. Be content with what God has blessed you with. As I close, we're going to look here at the last couple of verses. We're going back to Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're going to look at verse number, I believe it's seven. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Nor will cease from yielding its fruit. Young folks, let me break that down to you and we're going to wrap this up. When you're living right, when you're doing what God would have you to do in life, you're content where you're at. Now that doesn't mean you don't want to be a better you and do better for yourself. But you're not going to cheat. You're not going to be dishonest. You're not going to do things out of line. You're not going to disobey your parents to be successful. And when you live your life that way, you might have a lot of folks that won't call you your friend. They might say, well, I can't hang with them. They're they too, they too corny. They're too square. I, 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 can't, I can't associate with that. I have to have some fun in my life. Mm -hmm. And as humans, that's going to make us feel bad because it's going to make us feel less important. But we have to remember we are important in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. yes. We yes, have sir. value yes, in that's his right. eyes. That's why he sent his son that's to right. this earth to be a perfect sacrifice right. for you, 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 each and every one of you. You guys need to understand and know that. Amen. Jesus came for you personally. Yes. Say that. I, I want everyone in here to say that. Jesus came and died for me personally. He shed his blood for me personally. And because of that, I owe God everything. And because of that, I owe God everything. I promise you, if you wake up every morning with that mentality, yes, there is nothing in this world Amen. that will distract you or detract you or derail you from living your life as God has purposed. All right. If you're here today and you are not a Christian, All right. All right. there's a lot of folks out there teaching a lot of false doctrine yes. about how to be saved. Yes. I, I, I have to touch on this. If, if any man is going to be a minister of God's word, he has to preach the truth. Amen. And young folks, you need to know this. It's folk out there that will say all you have to do is say a prayer to be saved. 
And you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. That's right. Now you find examples of prayers in the Bible. Jesus showing people how to pray and when to pray. The Jews prayed a lot. You will not find a prayer in the Old or New Testament that winds up getting you saved or will put you in a saved state with God. It's not in a prayer. It's not in an altar call. It's not in catching the Holy Ghost. It is in none of those things. God requires certain steps for any man that has lived since the resurrection of Christ to take in order to be in a saved state with God. That person must hear the word. And in hearing what you're hearing is that how Jesus came and gave his life and shed his blood. Not only that, showed us how to live, how to love, how to treat everybody else, how to carry and conduct ourselves. All of that, see, see, a lot of times we just, we, we just kind of narrow it down to, to one church. The, the one church is there, but you have to look at how Christ lived. Amen. That's how the one church is supposed to operate. That's how the one church is supposed to look. Amen. It's supposed to look like Jesus did. That's why right. we talk about what would Jesus do. That's why we're called Christians, because we're supposed to be Christ-like. That's right. So that's what you have to hear in hearing the word. And you have to hear how Jesus died. And when he died, he purchased our sin. And he purchased the church. Matthew 16 and 18, he said he would build it. He foretold it. He prophesied it came to pass. Apostles preached on the day of Pentecost. And everybody, that, those that gladly received the word, first, the first thing they did is they asked, what shall we do? And you need, if you're not a member of God's kingdom, let me say this, if you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins, Amen. you need to be asking yourself right now, what shall I do? Yes, sir. Because baptism is part of salvation. Amen. It's not the only part. Now, you've got some people that teach on it so much, you'll think that it's the only part. It is not the only part. Because we have to, as I say, we have to hear we have to believe what we have heard. Amen. We have to make a decision. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To change our life. Once we decide we believe what we heard, we have to be willing to change. Yes, sir. We know that faith alone is not enough. The devil believes in Jesus. Amen. Bad people believe in the law. They just don't abide by it. This this guy that just went on this rampage yesterday and, and the night before shooting up all of downtown Dallas. I'm pretty sure if he was still alive and someone could talk to him, he would say, I believe in law. But clearly he did not abide by it. So we have to make a change in our lives and we're going to abide by what we believe. Repent of our sins. We have to confess Jesus is Christ. These are things that are required. Jesus said in Scripture, you confess me before me, I will confess you before my Father. And if there's one thing we want to hear Jesus say is, I know him. Amen. Or I know him. Amen. Once we have done all that, all right. then we are ready to get in that water. That's right. Like the Ethiopian youth did, like the house of Cornelius did, like Paul, yes. like those people in Acts 2. We have to go in the water. Right. That's right. Because that's where we reach the blood. That's right. And it's the blood that cleanses us and saves us. Right. The water itself, let me clarify this. Come on. The water itself does not save us. All right. All right. Well. It is not the water. So I don't want anyone leaving here thinking that. It is the obedience to God. Yes. Right. Yes. Come on. Yes. In going down in that water. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. Obedience to God is what it takes to get to heaven. But you have some folk that are so caught up in, well, I'm just going to praise God and, and, and let the Spirit move me. The Bible says obedience is better, better than sacrifice. That's right. It's better. You know what that means, young folk? Just, just as an example, an analogy for you. If you decide, I'm going to bring my teacher lunch tomorrow, you've got to care how much to see. That's fine. Well, good. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do it again. But if the teacher has stated before, uh, as part of the rules of the school, I cannot accept meals or food from any of the students, 
While it may be in your best interest in mind to watch, I'm just trying to make sure, you know, I like the way Miss Jones teaches or, or Miss Smith teaches. I like the way she conducts mm -hmm. class. I just want to do something nice for her. Mm -hmm. Obey the rule. Yeah. Obey the rule. Mm -hmm. right. And while it's easy for us to say, hey, you know, I, I just, it, I feel good doing this or I feel good where I'm going. Are they teaching God's word All right. in the way that it's supposed to be taught? All right. All right. All right. All right. Because if they're not, regardless of how good you feel, I promise you, you won't feel good with your intentions. He won't feel good then. Once we go down in that water, God cleanses us of our sins, and then we we raise up. And that's not the, a lot of people say, well, that's the, that's the end. No, that's just the beginning. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Because now that you have come out of where you were, you have to learn how to walk in that new life yes, and sir. observe the new thing. And then, see, this is where that coming together daily and often plays a vital part in your life. Yes. All right. It's where it plays a vital part. If you're subject to the invitation, you can come, come as together we stand and sing. Yes. Thank you, Lord.